Uh, my name is Danielle George, and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator for Northwest Veg. And just a little bit about me for folks who don't know me already. Um, I have been a vegan for um, since 2007, and um, I've been on, you know, it's a journey. been on a vegan journey for quite a while. And something that I'm passionate about is making food accessible to people, whether they plan on being vegan, whether they plan on just making a meal that doesn't have dairy or animal products in it just for that one meal, um, even if they're just experimenting and want to try something, or maybe they're trying to make something for their loved one. So uh, part of the sauce series goal is that we know we have a lot of folks who are trying to maybe open up new ideas, new experiences for the new year. And a part of that might be, how do I consume less meat? Or how do I consume less animal products? And that can be really overwhelming when you're starting that journey. The internet is a boundless place. It's very easy to read 50 different food blogs and not be able to tell the difference between somebody who is maybe having a health focus on um, their cooking and their recipes and someone who has um, a comfort food focus or a sustainability focus. And you might not know the message that that person is broadcasting or the reasons why they are broadcasting uh, the recipes they are. So then when you make that food, you may be tempted to paint all um, plant-based or non-animal product foods that way. And so if you ended up having like making a carrot hot dog, um, if that's not what you were in the market for, and then you think, okay, I know now I don't like vegan food or vegetarian food. So um, there's a wide, wide array of, there's a whole spectrum out there of vegan food. And we wanna do our best to represent um, all kinds of different choices out there. And a part of that is having diversity in not only um, the angles of veganism, but also the representation of the flavors, um, the foods that you see on the table. We wanna make sure that everyone feels represented when they are trying to decide if plant-based or vegan vegetarian food is for them. So the sauce series is a great journey to go on because we also know folks are probably feeling like, oh, maybe I want to reevaluate how much money I spend, or maybe I want to reevaluate um, menu items that I've been making. Um, and so we want to try to make a sauce series that you pick your protein, you pick your grain, and then um, our sauce will help accent that. So it should be a pretty budget-friendly, accessible um, journey for a lot of folks to join us on. So today we are gonna be making a marinara sauce and an Alfredo sauce, which will be great for you know, whatever pasta you wanna make. Um, you can also use it for pizzas, lasagna, things like that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started going over the sauce here in just a minute, but I also wanted to start off by reviewing the recipes and a little bit about the sauce. Um, specifically, we're gonna dive into the marinara sauce, just for a little bit of food education. So in the US, we refer to marinara sauce as kind of a, it's assumed to be a bit more of a complex sauce than um, what we would see as this, tomato sauce, right? So we see tomato sauce as primarily some kind of processed, watery tomato um, product. It's not as thick as ketchup. It doesn't have the rich, boldness and concentrate feeling is tomato paste, uh, but it certainly has more to it than tomato juice. So that's what we are usually referring to when we talk about tomato sauce. So when we talk about marinara sauce, I think for many people in the US, we are thinking of a cooked sauce that is gonna have some complexity, but I would argue that it's actually really important that we um, recognize that to other folks, marinara sauce means a more simple sauce and tomato sauce would mean um, the more complex sauce. And certainly like they would probably say canned tomato sauce or freshly prepared tomato sauce. So kind of diving into the difference between the two. Marinara sauce is just kind of a quick and dirty sauce that uh, folks in Italy and other parts of Europe um, they would recognize as great for pizza, for lasagna, um, you know, if you were just doing, wanting to make a quick pasta dish, and especially if you're going to be putting a lot of other ingredients in with it, 
um, like any kind of pasta casserole or anything like that, breadsticks, dipping sauce, stuff like that. So what we are doing when we make a marinara sauce is we're actually borrowing complexity from a couple of other areas, specifically um, like we know that wine has a lot of complex layers um, in the flavors that it brings. So we're kind of leaning into that complexity and we're piggybacking off of it with our sauce. Um, it's a very basic sauce and it cooks really quickly. So you're not gonna have a lot of depth to the flavors, but not a lot of people when they are just having um, really quick and easy spaghetti or pizza are looking for a lot of complexity and depth in the sauces. But, um, so it's, it's essentially a shortcut by leaning kind of onto more things like the, the wine. If we were doing a classic um, tomato sauce or, or a Sunday gravy as it might be called or a Sunday sauce, then that would be something that would be a minimum of two and a half uh, hours to make. It would, we would be focusing on using canned tomatoes. Um, traditionally, you would use like a San Mer um, Marzano tomato. Um, they're canned and they're imported from Italy. So in that instance, we would be using tomatoes and we would be using them in their whole form. And then we would usually have something really rich with it too, like a rich stock. And um, the classic ingredients would usually talk about putting in some kind of meat product and caramelizing it and kind of slowly cooking it, then adding in your tomatoes and then cooking it on very low heat for hours at a time. I would say probably if we were making our custom tomato sauce, we would do the same of a, a caramelization of like a lot of onion and mushroom to give that umami kind of rich flavor and that complexity. But um, we're the point of this sauce series is to do kind of that quick and dirty piggy piggybacking sauce. So something that somebody doesn't have to feel like the world's most accomplished chef to make. And it also doesn't feel like um, you have to have all of the time and all of the ingredients and all of the different heavy bottomed pots and things like that. So this is gonna be the basic marinara sauce, something that I think most Americans are very familiar with. Uh, you can absolutely add in some Beyond Meat or uh, soy crumbles or anything else like that if you wanted to give it a meatier texture, but we're just gonna be doing this, the basic sauce. So I wanted to dive into kind of the difference just to make sure that folks are on the same page. Um, we might end up doing a tomato, a classic tomato sauce and talking about the pros and cons and the differences and the complexities that you get from it later. But today we're gonna to be sticking to something that is more basic. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna use, we wanna get our onion and we're gonna to wanna to chop it. You can chop it pretty roughly or you can finely dice it. Um, it's your preference. I know some folks really like having kind of, um, a really chunky tomato sauce and other folks are looking for more of a creamy experience. If you don't like having any chunks in it, you could be tempted to put your onion in a food processor and I wouldn't recommend doing that just because you're not gonna get even chopping if you do that. Some of it's gonna get pulverized, some of it's going to still be a little chunky and you're almost gonna end up with like an onion cream at some point. Um, and you're going to have broken down a lot of the cells in the onion. You know, the onion is so much of it is water. And with it being so much of it being water, if you were to pulverize it, um, similar if you think of when you peel an orange and you see the little sacks of juice in there, we have something somewhat similar happening to the onion. And if we were to do that, uh, you're going to lose a lot of the complex flavor that you get with like browning the onion while we're sauteing it, because so much of the moisture will have already been pushed out of it when you were blending it. So if you like it to be as finely chopped as possible, I would just recommend you can get one of those um, hand chop gadgets in the kitchen or just be super patient and chop it as finely as you can because you're not gonna wanna do that much damage to the compounds of the onion. So, I'm gonna go ahead and get my pot that we're gonna be making. I'm gonna get it onto um, my stove and I'm gonna go ahead and put it on just on medium low. Um, we don't need it to get super de duper hot because we're not scorching these onions. We just wanna kind of sweat them a bit and get them soft. And so we don't need to have it be too, too hot. 
You also don't want it to be too low because I'm assuming you're probably not looking to cook your onions for 20 or 30 minutes. So just kind of play with the temperature if you're a new cook. And also if you're on a new stovetop, every stovetop is different. They all have different temperaments. While I'm working with these onions, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what kind of onion do you pick for this sauce. And onions are fun because there's so much complexity with onions. And if you spend any time kind of looking into the world of onions, you know, you recognize we've got onions, we've got garlics, we've got leeks, we've got spring onions and shallots and green onions. And some things are marketed as different when they're actually the same. Some things are marketed as the same when they're actually different. Um, but for the most part, when we are, when we're talking about the onion, and the taste and the smell and that pungent, um, not bitterness, but that distinctive onion flavor and smell. When we're addressing that, what we're really talking about is sulfur. So onions have um, a high combination of water and sulfur. And that sulfuric compound is what's giving the onion that bite. Like if you were to crunch into a raw onion and it kind of makes you tear up, that sulfur is what's making that happen. So when we are working and picking with our onions, um, knowing kind of what onion has high amounts of sulfur and low amounts of sulfur can help you decide what you're looking for for that situation. Um, interestingly, sulfur is also what helps keep it shelf stable. So if you're familiar with cooking with onions, you've probably noticed you can have an onion on your pantry, in your pantry for weeks to months on end. And it's that sulfur compound that's helping keeping it keep it shelf stable. So the um, yellow onion or the brown onion is the one that I just chopped. It's onion skin looks like this. The yellow onion has the highest amount of sulfur in it. And so because of that, it is one of the most shelf stable onions. Um, it is also the most bite. It's got the most bite to it. So this is an onion that could be a little rough for some folks to eat raw. So if you were gonna just toss it onto a salad or something, it could have the most punch to you. Um, but then, you know, you get that shelf life. Now a red onion like this, it's got kind of this purpley ruby color. The red onion has less sulfur in it than the yellow onion, um, which means that you actually get more of a little bit more of a delicate taste. It can be a little sweeter. Um, it's a little bit more mellow. So if you were going to put it again in a raw salad or something like that, it wouldn't have as much of that overwhelming onion bite to it, but that does mean that these go bad faster than the yellow onions do. Either one of these onions are great for making sauces because um, we're not in a situation where we have to worry about how much bite it's going to have raw because we're cooking it and we're going to make it sweat and then it's going to be kind of dissipating that onion and sulfur out into our sauce. So that is fine. Either one of those works. Now, sweet onions, I get a lot of people who are tempted to cook everything with sweet onions, especially if they are sensitive to that onion punch when they are maybe like sauteing, doing a stir fry, making a sauce. Um, sweet onions, as you might have suspected from what we've just been talking about, have the lowest level of sulfuric compounds in them. So that is why they have almost that, that sweet, way more mellow flavor. Um, that does also mean that they have the lowest shelf life. So ideally they should be stored in the refrigerator because they can break down so, so quickly. Um, but because they have so much less sulfur, then that also means that there's not a lot of complexity and they don't have that intense onion flavor. So they are already way, way back in the, um, if I was gonna make a stir fry presenting onion flavor. So then if I were to cook it, I'm actually even sweating out more of that sulfur, um, the, the little bit that it even had. So if I were to caramelize it, uh, or if I were to make it into a sauce, I'm not gonna be getting any benefit from that, if that makes any sense, because the punch of the onion is already diluted when we cook it, or when we caramelize it, it gets sweeter naturally, we're bringing out the sugars. Um, if you started with that sweet onion, you're losing the punch. So you're getting less onion essence and sweet onions are quite expensive. So I will now have paid more money to have an onion 
that I'm actually getting less onion flavor and it's doing less work in the sauce. So my sauce won't have the same complexity and layers in it um, as it would if I had used a punchier onion. So unless you're really, really partial to it, I would recommend not using um, a sweet onion. Just as a little side fact um, for that as well, I would say something that I always found really interesting with um, sweet onions is that sweet onions, um, you can see like there are Maui sweet onions, there are Valdesta, um, Georgia sweet onions, and then there's been the Walla Walla, and there's been several other places that now have their own kind of sweet onion. But the vast majority of sweet onions are actually all the same variety. Um, the grano onion, which is a strain that came from Spain in the um, 1930s and it was introduced into Georgia and then it kind of spread from there. So when you see a Maui sweet onion or a Georgia sweet onion or all of these different kinds of, of, of Texas has a couple as well, um, you're not going to get any kind of onion that's necessarily promised to be a superior sweet onion um, or radically different than the onion that you might eat from any of the others. The exception to that is the Walla Walla onion. So the Walla Walla onion was brought from, a, um, from Italy in the 1930s from uh, a French soldier brought it over and introduced it to Walla Walla. So the Walla Walla onion is a little bit different than the other kinds of sweet onion if you're in the sweet onion market. But just as a little fun aside, since we're not cooking with sweet onions today anyways. Um, so. I've got my onions chopped here. I went ahead and chopped them like this. They're not incredibly diced. They're just kind of finely chopped. And um, I am also gonna go ahead and get our garlic. And with garlic, there's a lot of different angles you can go with garlic. I would recommend if you're buying garlic, not if you can get the, the hard neck or the, the stiff neck garlic variety, you're going to get so much better flavor. Um, the soft neck garlic is the vast amount of the kind of garlic that we see. Um, even if I was to buy a whole bulb of garlic, that's mostly what I would find at the store. So check out your farmer's markets and things like that um, to see if you can find any hard neck garlic. If you get soft neck garlic, that's fine. It, you're, it's the garlic you probably grew up with, so I'm, it's not gonna be bad. It's just not as complex of a flavor. I would stay away from elephant garlic. A lot of people really get a kick out of elephant garlic because it is huge. It's like the size of an onion um, and it can be really fun, but it actually has significantly lower compounds uh, that give you the garlic flavor than any of the other kinds of garlic that you're gonna find at the market. So because of that, it's kind of reckoned as the garlic for people who don't like garlic, um, which I don't know who those people are. So it's so mellow that in some instances it can be almost flavorless. So in that instance, I, I wouldn't recommend trying to make a sauce or a stir fry with it because you're not going to get a lot of satisfaction from the flavor depth it's gonna give you. So when you chop up your garlic, you can, again, you can make it fine, you can make it rough, it's up to you, but we are gonna add in our garlic a little bit after we add in our onions. So um, I've got my onions chopped up. Um, I've got my pot, I've got it on the heat here. Uh, I've added some of my olive oil and I'm gonna go ahead and get my onions cooking on there while I chop the rest of my garlic. I don't know if there's anything better than the smell of cooking onions. Even when I was a kid and I didn't like the taste of onions, I was always hooked by the smell of onions cooking. So we're gonna let those cook and if you've got a, a skillet or a stove top that gets very excited um, and kind of cooks on a high heat, then you're going to want to stir them a little bit just to make sure that they sweat evenly and they get brown evenly. So I'll go ahead and finish working on chopping up our garlic. 
And while I do, I just want to tell you a little bit about the olive oil because we are using olive oil to cook um, the beginning part, the, the sauteing part of our sauce today. And there's a lot of different options that you can have when it comes to picking your olive oil. Um, the first thing that you're gonna wanna look at when you're picking your olive oil is, is it extra virgin? Is it virgin or is it light? I am using light olive oil and you can tell because it's got this kind of golden look to it. Um, extra virgin olive oil has, um, you know, it's the highest quality of olive oil that you can get. It is processed with just pressed olives. Um, there's no chemical additives. Uh, there was no heat used to, to get out the olive oil from the olives. So it is like the purest, most um, straightforward and highest quality and therefore most expensive um, olive oil that you can get. It also is the olive oil that is gonna have all of those um, omega-9 fatty acids. So if you're looking for something, if that's, that's something that you're trying to get more of in your diet, then you would be wanting to get the extra virgin olive oil. If that's not something that you're looking for and price is a little bit more in your wheelhouse, what you're paying attention to, then virgin olive oil is really um, just a lower version of the extra virgin. Uh, it's a little lower quality olives, uh, the pressing, maybe not as thorough. So it's gonna be a little bit lighter in color than the dark green, the kind of like yellowy green of the extra virgin. But it's still like, it's gonna have some of those fatty acids. Um, it's gonna cook fine, it'll taste fine. It just won't have as rich and robust of a flavor. And then you have the light olive oil. So I'm using the light olive oil for my sauteing just because there's a lot of contention about whether or not you should even saute with olive oil. It's, um, it's smoke point is 375 degrees, which is actually pretty low um, when you compare it to vegetable oil, which is 428. And so if I were trying to cook anything that especially had to cook for a long time, I would never make mozzarella sticks with olive oil because the smoke point just can't handle that. So a lot of chefs will tell you that the best sauteing oil really is just um, to use vegetable oil. And if you're using an expensive olive oil, chances are the act of sauteing it and getting it to that high heat is breaking it down anyways. And you're certainly not gonna be able to taste all of the subtleties that the olive oil could have given you had you had it raw or put it in at the very end. So for instance, if I was gonna make like um, kale and I was sauteing the kale and onions, I would do that in, in either light olive oil or vegetable oil. And then if I wanted it to have that taste of olive oil, I would douse some on top and toss it at the very end. Uh, the same with sesame oil. If you've ever tried to cook something in sesame oil for a long time, you almost can't taste it by the time it's over because we've burned off so much of it. Um, but we're not trying to make our sauce have like a very distinctive olive oil taste. So if you are gonna cook with an olive oil today, I would say absolutely do light um, or absolutely feel comfortable using canola oil, any kind of vegetable oil. Um, I just wouldn't recommend using the extra virgin or the virgin just because it is gonna get smokier faster and it's quite expensive. It's so much more expensive than the light and you're not gonna get the benefits. You're not gonna get the fatty acids nor are you gonna get the flavor because you cooked it off by the time you're eating it. So just as a little touch on that. Now, um, I've chopped up my garlic here. You can absolutely add more garlic. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and add in my garlic. Now we add in our garlic after our onions have cooked a bit, just because garlic cooks quite quickly. It's a very sensitive vegetable, and so it can actually get bitter if you overcook it. So we don't want it to be cooking too, too long. And I see my onions are turning kind of a clear. I'll bring it over here in just a minute. Let's see if we can get this. So you can see they're not 
burnt. They are slightly kind of browning now. They're sweaty. Um, so I'm going to let this cook for about another 30 seconds or so. And while I'm waiting for that, I'm going to go ahead and add my Italian seasoning. When we're making um, our sauces or our soups or anything like that, we want to we want to make sure that we are doing our seasoning and our salting at least a little bit at the beginning. That's allowing the heat and the oil um, and the onion, which has just started to sweat out its liquid, to all get infused together. Um, if I were to add my dried herbs later, um, as this as the sauce has kind of all gotten together, it would take so much seasoning to make the same impact. And I don't think you would ever actually get the depth of flavor the same. So I do think that it's a good idea to season as you go. Like you don't always want to just put all your seasoning in because then it can be kind of hard to back up and fix that. But at the beginning step, whether you're making a soup or whether you're making a stock or even if you're making a sauce, we want to make sure that we do put in a little bit of salt and um, a little bit of our seasoning, our, our dried seasoning um, at the beginning. So that way it can get evenly distributed and it is building on all of the flavors that we add as we go. We don't wanna add our herbs, our fresh herbs right now because similar to the garlic, it can get bitter because it's got little tiny chemical compounds in it that explode in our mouth when they're fresh. And when it added to heat and cooked over long periods of time, they actually kind of start to break down and then the sugars that we enjoyed when that tasted so fresh when we were biting into it now have dissipated and we're left with kind of a bitter pulp. So um, we don't wanna do that. We're gonna leave our parsley till the end. But now that my onions and garlic have kind of gotten nice and clear, translucent looking, um, I'm gonna go ahead and add in the tomato sauce. and our tomato paste. And there's a lot of uh, discussion on whether or not, you know, you should be a tomato, canned tomato sauce person, um, or if you should use everything from scratch for best results. Uh, a fair amount of chefs that I have worked with and that I know have done taste tests with canned tomato sauce and homemade tomato sauce in an American term, and couldn't really taste the difference and certainly didn't feel like it was worth the hours long process of um, making it on your own. Now, if we were talking about the Italian Sunday gravy, uh, that's a totally different thing. And then of course, lots of people would be, I think have very strong feelings about using tomato, American canned tomato sauce instead of reducing down our whole tomatoes. But since we're doing our piggybacking kind of cheat sheet sauce, that's okay. So we're also adding in the tomato paste. And so now we've done our onions that were diced, our garlic that was diced. Um, we're adding in the two cans of tomato sauce and the one can of tomato paste. And we just let this stir for a minute get all acclimated to the heat and evenly, evenly heated. You're gonna to wanna to stir it a little bit to make sure that the paste gets broken up. You don't want the paste to be on its own in like one big chunk. And I'll bring this up so that you can see. Let's see if I can get my phone here. There we go. So. Um, it's got some chunks in it because I can see my onions. I don't particularly like uh, a chunky sauce, so mine's just kind of moderate. So we're going to go ahead and let this cook um, for a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and add our wine here in a minute. So we're going to be using a third of a cup of wine. If you were in a pinch, you can use um, a solid cup of wine or a measuring cup, you know, that you would use to measure your flour and things like that. Luckily, sauce is kind of 
it's an easy going like you you don't have to be the most precise it's not like baking um if i was doing something like baking i would not recommend ever subbing um a solid or a liquid measuring one is by volume and one is by mass and so i wouldn't recommend switching that but with a sauce we can be a little bit more but um i've got my measuring cup here so we're going to be putting in um, a third of a cup of our wine so this wine, this wine is a Charles Shaw Shiraz, Shiraz, and it's quite fruity smelling. And I am not someone who really partakes in a lot of wine. So when I am cooking with wine, I like to be as educated as possible in trying to understand the palate matching. And even if you are someone who drinks a lot of wine, the palate matching may not be the best guide because chemical reactions are happening um, beyond that. So you could taste, take a wine that you think, oh, this is gonna taste great in this sauce. And maybe it would have tasted great with the sauce, um, but once it is cooking and it's exposed to the acidity of the tomatoes and the salt and the onion, um, it, something could break down and it could change. So when it comes to cooking sauces with wine i think there are some good takeaways here just rules of thumb number one um, that i have learned is that zinfandels can end up having kind of um an overly fruity or jammy taste and texture in your sauces so even if you find like a red zinfandel it i think it's sugar content is just a little off so it can be hard to pivot with that so that's one thing that I feel like I've, I've just definitely, I've read that in um, America's Test Kitchen. I found that to be true as well. Um, what I have found that they recommended, and I think is a great rule of thumb too, is when in doubt, go for a blend. Because if it's got a variety of different kinds of grapes, then if there's one grape that's kind of having um, a bad reaction, it's not the entire cup of wine or the entire amount that you put in your recipe, so hopefully some of the other varieties of grapes that are in that will be able to complement it or override it. So at least it's not a complete lost cause. So if you can find anything that's a blend, a red house blend is great. Um, you can put white wine in your marinara sauce. It is gonna give it uh, a fruitier, perfumey um, experience. I personally don't like that, but you can always experiment with that. Another thing that I would say absolutely to be mindful of um, when you are buying your wine is avoid wine that has been um, oak aged. So when wine has been oak aged and then we are exposing it to the heat and the acidity of the tomato sauce, the sugars start breaking down and joining in with the rest of the tomato sugars and things like that. But the oak, that hint of oak that was so good in the wine by itself, it actually stays and similar to when I was talking about the herbs, the fresh herbs um, and those sugars leaving in it and going to play with the rest of the sauce. And then you have this bitter pulp. That's almost the same thing that's happening with the wine. So if you have something that's oak aged and you put it in your sauce, those sugars are going to react. They're going to start mixing with the acidity of the tomatoes, the sugar from the onions, the sulfur from the onions. And then that oak, it is not designed to play with any of those other things. It doesn't have the compounds to match with and to complement. So it just stays by itself and it actually gets louder. So when we have a, a wine that has any kind of oak aged, or if you were cooking with like a sherry or a brandy or anything like that, um, and it has oak aged in it, then just be mindful of that because the oak will get louder and then it'll have like um, a very bitty, a, a bitter kind of wood um, taste to it. And so it, it's, it is complex, it, take, it hits your tongue in waves, but I wouldn't say that it's a positive experience. So um, I would recommend just double checking and if, if at all possible, make sure to read, read the description and not buying anything with that. So um, I've added the wine into there and then I'm gonna add a little bit of sugar that's gonna be to my taste. Um, the sugar is actually gonna kind of round out all of these flavors and kind of help them mellow out, complement, bring up the onion, um, bring out the garlic. But we don't want a sweet marinara sauce. You don't 
want it to taste like a fruit juice. So it's just a taste. Um, it's just something that you can kind of play a little bit with. And it also is gonna depend on the kind of wine you put in. If you put in a particularly sweet wine, chances are good you're not gonna need to add that much sugar um, because you're just gonna be making it taste even sweeter and fruitier. Um, but if you put in a really dry wine and it, you can taste it on the back of your tongue, um, then you, you will be in a situation where you're gonna want to potentially add in some of the sugar. So let's just taste, let's see how that is. Yeah, that Shiraz is both a little tangy and a little sweet. So this is a great opportunity to kind of talk about the improvisation that you go through when you make sauces and soups. So um, little rules of thumb for sauce fixes. If you were to make something that was too garlicky, uh, or too rich or too heavy, which this is a tip that we'll apply to when we make more of our Alfredo sauce because Alfredo can absolutely be any of those things. You're gonna wanna put in a splash of lemon, uh, lime if you have it and you're out of lemon, lemon would be better because it's gonna complement uh, the tomatoes a little bit better. Lime can be a little striking. It can be a little incongruent. If you don't have either of those, apple cider vinegar, um, or a white wine. In that instance, just a splash. We're not doing a lot. We're literally doing maybe like a tablespoon at a time. And then we're stirring it and we're letting it set for a minimum of 30 seconds. A lot of people, when they're trying to fix their sauces, will like splash something, stir, taste. And we have to wait for everything to kind of ease into it and unlock new things. So that balancing act is going to take about 30 seconds. So you're going to want to taste it, stir, rest, taste, and then repeat. But again, so if it's too garlicky, too rich, too heavy, something to brighten that up, that citrus, that acid is gonna cut through that. So apple cider vinegar, lemon, lime, dry white wine. If it's too bland, which again, we can apply to when we make something that's a creamy sauce like the Alfredo. If it's too bland, a little bit of salt can really help unlock that. Um, I would also say if you wanna add in some more dried or fresh herbs and just kind of play with that. And then, um, let it rest for even longer. Let it rest for maybe five minutes because creamy sauces often absorb flavor and then kind of reabsorb. And then so that first, when you taste it, when it's warm and it's fresh off the stove, you think this tastes mostly like cream. Then an hour later, all that complexity is kind of bloomed in it. So time will tell with your creamy sauce, but a little bit like a pinch of salt can really help with that. Um, if you make something that's too salty, then sugar or lemon or white wine will help cut from that. It's going to distract it. You can always add, you know, dilute it. But if that's not the case and you're in a situation where you can't dilute it, um, adding something that's going to layer on top and distract the tongue from the salty experience and then complement it with like, oh, okay, I, I taste fresh, light, and a hint of tang, then that's going to cut through that saltiness. Um, and if it's too acidic or sour, then again, salt will work. So this works great for soups, um, for any kinds of sauces, or even like if you've made a cup of coffee or you're, you're at a diner and you get a cup of coffee and it's a little bitter, um, then if you put just literally just a pinch of salt and stir it, let it sit for a minute, it'll neutralize that bitterness um, or that sourness. So Salt is a wonder and when used appropriately and not over the top, it can really, really bring a lot to your palate. So I'm gonna go ahead and taste this again. I think I'm gonna add a little bit of salt because it's just a touch. I can taste, um, it's a little bit too sweet. Um, and I feel like it's it's fruity, and I feel like that fruitiness will be cut with the salt. Um, I don't think it's actually too sweet. I think it is the, the fruitiness from the wine. If you're in like a really rough situation, I think adding um, a beef broth cube, if you've got one like a, uh, I really like to use Edward and Sons, um, not beef. If, if you're in a really rough spot, I think this would do well. A lot of traditional marinara sauces would be using 
um, beef stock in this anyways. So if you need something to kind of pair with the, the, the dark red of the wine, then, and still give salt, and you're not just adding salt, 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 but you want something that kind of adds salt and complexity, I think your red wine would do well with that. So now I'm gonna go ahead and add in our fourth of a cup of finely chopped parsley. Um, we're gonna do, we do this primarily at um, the end. I wanna do it not when I'm ready to serve necessarily, but when I'm kind of lowering the heat because it is going to unlock it, those flavors and it's gonna add freshness to it. So I wanna know what it's gonna taste like. Um, and it shouldn't get bitter because I'm not boiling it. I'm not cooking it submerged in anything for too long. So I'll go ahead and rinse this and I'm gonna just chop off what I think is gonna be close to about our fourth of a cup. For our new cooks, just uh, if you're not used to cooking with fresh herbs, um, you know, you can use the parts of the stem like this when, if, if you need to, it's ideal to go ahead and kind of pluck things off and have about this much stem. You're not, it's not ideal to use this, but you can if you have to. Um, but you certainly don't wanna be using this. This is so tough and fibrous and it's not going to break up well in your sauce. So if you've got the time and the patience, it's great to go ahead and kind of de-stim your parsley a little bit. But as long as you are committed to finely chopping, and this is something that you could put in very small batches and again, that hand chopper um, or in like a very small um, food processor, but I wouldn't put it in a big food processor and I wouldn't put it in a blender for the exact same reasons I was saying with the onion. I think you would be in a situation where you're gonna pulverize it to the point where it's probably gotten hot, it's dry because it was in a food processor. Um, and I think half of it is going to be kind of a parsley paste now, and half of it is going to be still floating around pretty chunky. And if your whole goal was to not have stems, I think that that's gonna be a lot more pain and trouble than it was worth. You don't have to be too finely chopped with this. Um, if you destemmed it. I think that it cooks down pretty evenly. And while you're chopping it, you can take, you can smell how fresh it is going to provide. So if you chopped it like this, let's turn this down just a little bit. Um, if you chopped it like this, I think you're gonna be fine. If you wanna chop it more finely, absolutely knock yourself out. So, my sauce is just gently simmering right now. And I'm gonna go ahead and stir in my parsley. Now, could you use dried parsley with this? You could. I think parsley is something that if I was using something that had, um, if it had a really loud flavor, like if I was making like a creamy soup, and I needed parsley to kind of punch through something, maybe I would use dried parsley. But if I'm looking for it to just complement other things, I think fresh parsley is gonna be better. I think dried parsley can have kind of a musty taste sometimes, especially if you've had it in your cabinet for years. So I feel like I, I wouldn't bet on using um, dried parsley. Uh, it, it just isn't gonna give you that fresh boost that I think that fresh parsley does. So I'm gonna go ahead and let the marinara sauce just kind of sit and, and simmer for just another couple minutes. While I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and start making our um, Alfredo sauce. So if you have a blender that can't handle um, high blending capacity and really getting stuff smooth, then I would recommend that you take your one cup of raw cashews. You can also use oats if you wanted to make it and you're, you have an allergy to cashews. Um, and one cup of water. Normally we would bring the cup of water to a boil. We would add in the cashews and we would let them sit um, for just about 15 minutes and then we would blend them. Um, my Vitamix is in a situation where it can handle that. And we're not missing out on any complexity. Um, there's nothing like food 
taste wise that we're going to be getting from that experience. It's really just something to help out your blender. So I'm going to go ahead and take my cup of cashews and my cup of water and blend it. Now this sauce, you're going to make entirely your own. And what I mean by that is if you are someone who is a whole foods person and you are all about um, natural ingredients and minimizing oils and things like that, then you're not going to add a lot to this. We're going to be, you're going to be really focusing on the cashews, the parsley, um, the Italian seasoning and um, onion powder, garlic, things like that. If you are somebody who's like, I miss Alfredo sauce. I want something that tastes as much like I remember Alfredo sauce as possible. Then this basic recipe that I've given you, it's the skeleton and you're gonna build off of that. When I've been in the mood to make a really intense, like memorable, how I remember uh, Alfredo sauce, I've been in a situation where I have added um, vegan Parmesan, vegan cream cheese, vegan cream, um, vegan earth balance. And I added in because we're looking for adding in those, those fats, the saltiness that comes with the Parmesan. Um, so this is the, this is the skeleton and you can absolutely build off of it, but this is going to be a starting point. And I think it's a good stopping point before we get to the fork in the road where somebody who might be more whole foods balanced is like, I don't want all the processed stuff. And somebody for all the processed stuff so I'm here for comfort. So I'm going to go ahead and blend um, my cashews. I'll go ahead, I'm going to mute my camera um, just so that way you guys don't have to hear my blender. So I'll be right back. Okay, and Linda taught me that tip when we were talking about food demos, and I am so grateful to not have to worry about blasting your ears out with my blender. So I'll show you the consistency here. Um, you can see it's pretty thick. Um, and so it's pretty thick. Um, so this is the base. This is what we're starting with. And if we want to, if we want to add to that, then that's where we're going to add in those additional things like the onion powder, um, the chopped parsley, the cloves of garlic. Um, you can also use, and we use this for an Indian food cooking demo. If I was in a situation where I wanted more garlic flavor in my tomato sauce, um, or more garlic flavor in this, then I would absolutely use uh, the, I would absolutely use the dried garlic because if I put fresh garlic in this now, it's not gonna saute, it's not gonna unlock as much. Uh, it's just gonna be clumps of bitter little bits of garlic. Um, and this is great for sauces. So if you want to use this instead of garlic powder or fresh garlic, um, because you've already cleaned your blender or any reason for that, don't worry. Absolutely. You can use this or you can just use garlic powder. So we would mix in whatever ingredients we want. And again, like I've said, I have added in um, earth balance, Parmesan. Um, let's see, I think I've got, I've got some vile life. Parmesan that I would grate in there from looking for that Alfredo experience. The cashews have provided us with the fat in the cream. 
Um, so we have started with the fat and the cream, but traditional Alfredo would have a fair amount of butter in it, um, which you can also put in some of that olive oil that we were talking about. And in this instance, I would use the extra virgin olive oil because we're coming for the flavor. So we would be getting some complex flavor from that as well as extra fat. Um, the parsley is gonna lighten it up and the onion powder is gonna give it some depth as well. So you aren't just thinking, okay, I'm just eating cream. So um, this sauce is pretty simple. You can put it in a pot and slow cook it too and give it maybe about, I would say I would cook this in a small pot for probably about five minutes just to unlock that stuff. Because even if I blended it and it's still cold, um, I'm gonna wanna heat it up. And I would rather do it over the stove than the microwave because you aren't unlocking things in the same way when you microwave it. So if I was cooking this over the pot, my little garlic granules here, um, they're gonna kind of bloom. They're gonna let go of their garlic essence. The onion powder I put in there isn't just gonna be like it is in a ranch dressing. It's gonna actually like kind of open up as well. So it gets evenly distributed. Um, and then I can just taste as I go and I can add my parsley again at the end. I don't wanna cook it into um, that, but my dried herbs, like my Italian seasoning, I can absolutely put in. So the last little bit of time that I have left, I am going to do another taste test on my marinara. Yeah, that tastes good. So I'm gonna do a taste test on my marinara. And then I wanted to show you just uh, an inspiration of what you can do with these sauces. So if you're like, okay, Danielle, I made the marinara sauce, what do I do with it? I mean, you could obviously do pasta. You can obviously do um, like a spaghetti and meatballs. But um, one thing that is a recipe that I really enjoy is manicotti, or um, you can also get stuffed shells. So I went ahead and boiled ahead of time. Um, I've got a manicotti tube here, and I really like to make my own ricotta. And ricotta is kind of a Loosey goosey word because I wouldn't say that it has the same like tanginess that ricotta has. I would say that this has the consistency of that I'm looking for. And then I kind of, similar to the Alfredo sauce, I make it my own. So I'm going to show you. Let me get my flashlight here. Um, so this is tofu. And what I did with this is when I'm making a stuffing for my manicotti, I like to use a combination of, I use a combination of extra firm pressed tofu. So the extra firm pressed tofu, some folks saw this with the Indian food cooking demo. It's incredibly firm. It's, it's very spongy. Uh, it's very formed. So I'll just get some out so I can show you the texture. Um, it comes in these little bricks. You can find this at Asian uh, groceries. You can see it's very firm. And when I squeeze it, there's not a lot of moisture to come out of it. And so it's just got this kind of meaty texture. And then the other kind of tofu that's half this, and then it is half um, medium firm tofu. And for folks who are familiar with tofu, you know that when you see it come in this water package, it's going to be squishier. So it's kind of like you can, you could squish it through your fingers and it would crumble. So I use half of the very, very firm tofu and I use half of this kind of like crumbly wet tofu and I cook it, um, on my skillet. I add in, um, Italian seasoning and a little bit of nutritional yeast. And for new folks, nutritional yeast looks like this. And it has kind of a Parmesan flavor. So nutritional yeast would be a great addition to your Alfredo. Um, and it has, you know, it's just got, it's got a flaky, it doesn't need to be cooked. You can just put it on raw on top of anything. Um, so I put in a little bit of nutritional yeast and Italian seasoning. So what I get is, See if I can show this here. You know, it's got a little bit of bite to it because here's some of that thick tofu, and then here's some of the softer, squishier tofu. And I just mush it up until it's got a pretty ricotta esque texture. 
And then I cook up whatever sausage of my choice, um, or you could also do a walnut sausage. And then I stuff the manicotti tubes with it and then put it in a casserole dish, throw my marinara sauce and some cheese on top, bake it, and now I've got manicotti. And it's pretty healthy because we're getting um, pretty good resources from the tofu. Uh, we're getting some great vitamins from the nutritional yeast and we used our sauce. So that's what I recommend. Um, just if you're looking for something for inspiration, that's more than just spaghetti. It doesn't take that long. It saves great. You can also freeze it. Um, so I think that that would make a great recipe for you to start out with. And um, I'm somebody who really likes pink sauce. So I am not opposed to mixing half marinara, half Alfredo, and kind of making a rosé out of sauces. So that is our first sauce series for pick a protein, pick a grain, and kind of learn a little bit more. And I see Linda asked, is there a different nut that could substitute for cashews? So yeah, you could, I, I would substitute, since I am not eating cashews right now, um, I would make this with oat. And if I made it with oat, the only thing that I would say with that is that you are gonna want to add something that adds more fat into it um, for mouthfeel. Because otherwise it literally will taste like you blended oatmeal and you can kind of feel the particulate on your tongue um, and you can taste that oatiness. So I think if you were to put in an avocado um, to help get that fat into there, uh, um, or coconut oil, if you're somebody who uses coconut oil and you're fine with having that flavor, I think if you put in enough garlic and parsley, you're not gonna taste that as much. Um, that's gonna smooth out that entire experience. You can still do, um, I would do one cup of oats and one and a half cups of water because the oat is gonna soak up. That water is gonna get thick by itself. So I would add in just a little bit more water. And I would also put in a little bit of lemon on that situation, just to again, help distract from that background of oat flavor. Um, so that's a great question. Does anybody else have any questions um, for this week's sauce series? Okay, great. Well, um, if anybody has any questions, you can always email me at Danielle, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at NorthwestVeg, N-W-V-E-G, dot org. So hopefully everybody has uh, fun experimenting, and we will see you at the next sauce series.